This is just a brief follow-up to my last video on making the umebachi pattern and a few additional extra bits and pieces. After the last video, I made another umebachi panel and framed both to form a simple folding screen. When the patterns are quite complex, such as this one, I always prefer simplicity so that the patterns can speak for themselves and aren't overshadowed by too much surrounding complexity. More important than the finished product though, and the main purpose of this video, is that I'd like to answer a few questions that I'm regularly asked. The first one is how long does it take me to make the patterns, considering that other than the initial dimensioning, I do everything by hand. Obviously the time would depend on the pattern, size and other factors, but as an example, for this pattern it took me just under 14 hours to reach this point. That's all joints cut with my hand saw, jigumi and pattern pieces assembled, Skeko attached and the piece cleaned up to a finished state. To reach this stage with all joints in the jigumi and pattern pieces cut took me just under two hours. So from this to the finished panel took 12 hours. Which leads me on to the next point. Any time saved by using machinery to cut the joints would only have an impact on that initial two hours. The 12 hours will remain the same, regardless of whether the joints are cut by machine or hand. So any time saved by cutting the joints by machine would only be a small fraction of the overall time taken. And on complex hexagonal patterns such as this, I'm not convinced that machines would be faster. Yes, for the expensive machinery used by shoji makers in Japan, but not necessarily with the table saw. The next point is left and bottom kumiko orientation. In almost all the videos I've made, I emphasize the importance of consistent kumiko orientation. I also emphasize this to the students in my workshops to the point where their eyes start to glaze over. If you look at the simple jigumi on the screen, you'll notice that all the marks are oriented correctly either on the left or the bottom. The pitch is 45 millimetres, but can you notice anything unusual? In measuring and marking the horizontal kumiko, an error crept in, and I marked the second pitch at 46 millimetres and the third pitch at 44 millimetres. But if I had not told you, you wouldn't have noticed, simply because that one millimetre error is extremely difficult to detect. If you look at the same piece from the side, you'll notice that the vertical kumiko are perfectly straight, and now that you know, you may be able to just detect the slight difference. That's because the orientation is consistent, left and bottom. Now the same error, but this time the orientation of one of the incorrectly marked horizontal kumiko is reversed. And look what happens. Kinks that stand out like neon lights. This is even more pronounced when viewed from the side. The piece is ruined simply because one of the eight kumiko was oriented the incorrect way. That's all it takes. And this is why I continually emphasize the importance of consistent orientation. You can get by with minor inaccuracies in the square jigumi patterns as long as the orientation is consistent. I always use left and bottom, but you can use any combination you like, as long as it remains consistent. The next question is how I measure and achieve pitch accuracy. One of the tools I use for square patterns is a pair of compasses or dividers. In this example, I want an exact 40 millimeter pitch. I place the dividers on a ruler and adjust to 40 millimeters. But is it exactly 40 millimetres? The next step will tell. First I rule a line that's exactly 400 millimetres with a clear start and finish point. Next I walk the dividers 10 paces.
If the tenth pace is not exactly on the end mark, I make whatever adjustment is necessary and repeat. Once it hits the end mark, you know the dividers are set at exactly 40 millimetres. Then it's simply walking the dividers along the centre line of the story stick for the required number of joints at the 40 millimetre pitch. After that, it's just marking across each of the divider marks and the story stick is all done. I mainly use this method for the square patterns. The next method is the one I use for hexagonal or diamond patterns. This is more time consuming, but it assures me of consistent pitch marks. Mark a scrap piece of story stick with two marks of the desired pitch. Place the scrap piece next to the proper story stick and extend those two marks across the story stick. Move the scrap piece so that the left hand mark is lined up exactly with the right hand mark on the story stick. Then transfer the right hand mark on the scrap piece to the story stick. Repeat this until you have the required number of joints. As I mentioned, this is more time consuming, but accuracy and consistency is much greater. And if I have a large number of joints to cut, instead of two marks, I'll put five or six on the scrap piece. The final point is checking story stick accuracy for the hexagonal or diamond jigumi. I've mentioned this before, but this step is absolutely critical and should always be done. Once you've marked up the story stick, transfer those marks to a second story stick. Place the two story sticks together and move one of the story sticks one joint to the left or right. If the joints are still perfectly lined up, the story stick is accurate. If not, the story stick has to be redone. There's no other way if you want clean and attractive patterns. Well, that covers everything I wanted to touch on in this video. Kumiko work all starts with measuring and marking, and this is where you need to give yourself plenty of time. Because it doesn't matter how skillfully you can wield a handsaw, if the measuring and marking is off, the pattern is not going to come together. Thanks for watching, and I hope this video has given you a few tips to help you with marking accuracy.